the infraclavicular block, we did this for a lot of the uh, vascular re-implantation surgeries when patients would get their hands chopped off working in the garage. These are 12 hour, 24 hour surgeries. We would bring them to the OR, the senior resident would do the block and the junior would get stuck watching the patient for 12 hours if they were on call, 20 hours, I mean, it was miserable. And the, um, the nerves we, we, would, we would go for would be the infraclavicular brachial plexus block because this is a region that is a great place to put a catheter. It's a very stable spot where the catheter won't move and you could put the catheter in one location and reliably get anesthesia of all three cords of the brachial plexus. In addition, there was a very low uptake of local anesthetic in this region. We would give 20 milliliters of, of uh, lidocaine mixed with bicarbonate and epinephrine, two syringes worth, 2% lidocaine. We're talking 800 milligrams of lidocaine being injected within five to 10 minutes into a patient's brachial plexus. According to the books, that's a toxic dose, right? With epi, four to seven mg per kilo or seven to eight mg per kilo, we're talking about five and change, 500 and change, 560 milligrams is, should be your max. We're going way above that. And the only toxic reaction I even heard about was when they did a block on the dwarf and I, that was before my time. I don't know what they gave him, but this has been shown and I'm not telling you to do, to do this because I, I wouldn't advocate giving anything more than toxic doses, but this is what we were doing routinely and we never had any issues from it. And the reason is because this area has a very low uptake of local anesthetic. We would do this block for surgery distal to the shoulder, elbows, forearms, wrist and hand. Now, I remember when I first started at Maimonides, um, Dr. Gupta, Dr. Gupta is a doctor who runs the floor and he, he, he gave me one of my first cases was, was an upper extremity case. I took the ultrasound, I put it here. At the time I took an epidural needle because I didn't see the block needles there. Um, and this is what we used at NYU anyway. And I took the, uh, the, the Thule needle and I just went in right here with, with the ultrasound and you know, people kind of looked at me like, you know, what about pneumo? Aren't you worried? And you, you're very far lateral to pneumo. It's not really, um, it should not be an issue. Of course, it's an issue if you really don't know what you're doing or if you're not visualizing the tissue properly or if you're not lateral enough, if you don't know where your needle is. But if you know where your needle is, you know where the nerves are, you know where the lung is, it shouldn't be an issue. I, I never even heard of a case at NYU when we were doing this of a pneumothorax. It was very easy block to do pretty easy to set up. Uh, the CPT code, in case you're coding this, is 64415, like all the other brachial plexus blocks, and 76942 is the ultrasound read. This slide is meant to kind of go over whether or not you want to use a high or low frequency ultrasound. Now, in this area, you don't always need a, high, a low frequency probe or a high frequency probe. The advantage to the low frequency probe is if your patient's big, you're going to see the tissue better because it, it low frequency is more applicable for, for the deeper structures. If it's more superficial, then you want to use the higher frequency. But the problem with the high frequency probes are is that they're usually flat. The advantage to a round curve probe is that you can get between the clavicle and your probe very easily. And that's how we were doing this when we did this block with a curved probe. Now, looking at the imaging, the cords are hyperechoic. The lateral cord is commonly cephalad. The posterior cord is posterior to the artery. So here's the lateral cord, here's the posterior cord. And then the middle cord is right here. And this is seen between the artery and the vein. Okay, once again, the artery is more pulsatile. The vein may be collapsible, but can be bigger than the artery. Now, when we're going in with the needles, that's our target. We're going right below the clavicle above your ultrasound. We would typically take the needle, aim for the medial cord first, make sure you're in the sheath and that the local is spreading around the nerve. So it should be some blackness spreading here. Pull back the needle, redirect, aim to the lateral position and anesthetize the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. Then we would scoop up carefully, not traumatizing the nerve, of course. We were using a blunt needle for this. Then get to the six o'clock position of the artery 
and anesthetize around the posterior cord. This is also where we would place our catheter. After we would place our epidural catheter or our nerve catheter these days, uh, we would inject two or three mLs of air in this region to verify that we're getting adequate coverage. And you can see the air spread in this pocket right around here and make sure that you're getting um, coverage. Now, um, we've also done in, in the past, there were times when the surgeon would need to reevaluate the patient after surgery, their nerve function. So we would, revert, we would reverse this. We would just inject saline into the catheter. It would wash away the local to hasten the, 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 the uh, effects of the, of the drugs wearing off. Okay, so comparing, this is an old low frequency. This is the one I used to use at, at Bellevue. So it's really, this is like a, over 10 years old versus a newer high, higher frequency. So it's not really fair to compare these two ultrasounds, low versus high. But I guess the real purpose of the slide is to show you the curved view, how things will look when it's curved, okay? So here's your me medial cord, that hyperlucency, posterior cord, lateral cord, but you have more room to come in because it's a much smaller ultrasound probe. 